Sorry, I, I wasn't. Uh, okay, now my mic is on. Sorry, but uh, yeah. So, uh, Eric, good to be with you. Um, hope you're doing well. Uh, it's it's always good to have you on. Um, you know, it's good and it's bad, right? It's good because I like talking to you. It's bad because it seems like I only have yawn when the, when the Pope uh, sticks his foot in his mouth. So, uh, but but if, but how are you doing? How how are you doing? How how's life? Oh, I, I'm doing excellent. I'm doing excellent. Um, work is busy. Um, family life is busy. You know, as you know, I've got six boys, um, all aging from 16 down to three. So I've got. <clears throat> you know, the later teens and all that. And then all the way down to little ones still trying to keep us up at night. <laughs> so uh, I've got a full table for myself and uh, plus all the projects I'm working on um, and uh, trying to keep up with the current news, you know, like what we just saw recently with uh, Pope Francis. So otherwise I'm doing great. I'm, I'm glad to be here happy that you invited me on again so yeah yeah um i uh yeah i mean same here man like i i just had a just had a son uh this month oh congratulations yeah, yes i first i think point. i saw that on, on, yeah, on x yeah, yeah so that's been keeping me awake kind of all day right all day <laughs> all night around the clock so um that that's that that's quite a new experience um so but anyway uh yeah that's it's good it's good to hear man um so uh yeah I, I really wanted to have you on just just because it's always good to get your fresh perspective whenever we you know encounter a, a, a new and a, a, a fresh new uh papal controversy um i don't really like doing a stream every time one pops up but I, I feel like it's appropriate to do so when whenever it's uh you know a pretty serious one right right and and, and I feel like it's a pretty serious one this time um and, 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 yes yeah um, in fact I would say this is probably the most well one of the most serious blunders that we've yet to encounter um, and I'm just wondering if, if you want to kind of just take the floor, walk us through um, what your assessment of, of the situation is. We could go we could t we could go at this from any vantage point. If you want to start with what he actually uh, said and or, or what uh, the Vatican tried to um, smooth over with their ad libbed, uh, <laughs> you know, translation, which which wasn't quite accurate. Right, um, right. So, so where, where do you want to take us with this? I'm, I'm just very curious about your, and then we'll get into the, some of the reactions to what he said from the various like camps, like Pope Splainers, etc. Lofton's response. Yes, yes, yeah. So this, um, and, and please stop me when you when you want. I shouldn't be more than a few minutes here to to get us started. But uh, for those of you who don't know, which probably very, very few, most of those who are watching, the listeners of Classical Theist, um, are probably going to be aware of the recent news. But uh, the Pope had done a visit um, to Singapore and other places. And uh, in this particular, we are, we are going to be talking about two episodes. Uh, one where in Singapore, he's speaking to a, an audience, and he speaks upon the issue of the world religions. And then the second one is a, a video message that he gave to um, a congregation that was meeting in Albania, uh, people from the Mediterranean. Uh, so the first thing is what he said in Singapore, and I don't have a transcript in front of me, but most people have heard it over and over and over again. Uh, we've heard the uh, Trent Horn replay the, the video, Michael Lofton replay the video. It's all over Catholic news. Uh, so if you want to go watch it, just go to YouTube and type in Pope Francis address to Singapore. All religions are paths to God. And that's basically what he said. 
And he I mean, did I can want to just be... uh, read it really quickly, if you'd like. Go ahead. Yeah, please. That'll, yeah. that'll help. Some just, just for just for, you know, a context is always important. Um, so he said, and, and I'm and I'm not reading, by the way, from the Vatican translation, because I think everybody recognizes that yep. there were words added that he didn't actually say. Right. Um, that they, they, they were very much taking their their interpretive liberties with that. So so let, let me just read straightforwardly what he said in English. He said all religions are paths to reach God. They are to make a comparison, like different languages, different dialects, to get there. But God is God for everyone. If you start to fight saying my religion is more important than yours, mine is true and yours isn't. Where will this lead us? There is only one God, and each of us has a language to arrive at God. Some are Sikh, Muslim, Hindu, Christians. They are different ways to God. So that's the quote. Um, and I have my own thoughts on it. I have my own immediate reactions, my own ways of thinking about it. But but I am curious about, like, I, I really want to get your take. Like, do you think that, for, for, for one, first I want you to kind of tackle the immediate objection that comes into play right pope francis has said elsewhere so he said elsewhere that jesus is the only uh way jesus is the way the truth and the light he has affirmed that elsewhere so how would you deal with like the objection that if he's affirmed that elsewhere how can we interpret this at face value don't we have to come to the conclusion that he either misspoke was mistranslated somehow what do you think about that well, I, I don't think he was mistranslated. I think his words, uh, objectively, as they exist, his message um, is contrary to the dogmatic teaching of the church. It's contradictory to the biblical message. Um, so, And I, I'm emphasizing the, the words he used um, because there, there can be a distinction between what somebody says and what they mean. Although, you know, I've, I've, I've made note of this distinction in some of my posts in the last few days, um, that we're not really too concerned first and foremost with what he meant. Uh, we need to look at what he said. And is if that requires correction, then it doesn't really matter what he meant. Um, there is uh, a service that he owes the world, or at least the watching world that is affected by this, um, in order to correct what uh, what was said. So, objectively speaking, the message was wrong. It was heretical, it was contrary to the gospel, contrary to scripture. Uh, there's no way to reconcile it. I disagree with those who say that there's a um, a good way to interpret what he said. Um, somebody can somebody can say, well, what he meant was Christian exclusivism, but what he said was religious pluralism and indifferentism. And all we need for him to do is to come and clean up what he said. Okay, that's. I mean, I don't think that's the case. I, 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 I. I I actually think the probability is that he meant what he said, but I don't want to impute that. Um, so I, I think it's wrong, you know, to say that all the religions are paths to God uh, without some serious qualification is wrong. Even if, even with a qualification, for goodness sake, in, a, in, a, in an audience of young people, it's I, I strongly uh, recommend against that. But even, even so, he didn't give us a qualification. And then he compared the variety of religions and their utility to bring you to God. In other words, their function to bring you to God uh, or to arrive at God. He compared it to the variety of languages and each language, each language's respective function to establish communication or to arrive at communication. Right, because like I, I was thinking of that, and it's like, 
language, the variety of languages, that doesn't really admit of truth or false per se, right? Like the variety of languages are different ways at getting at the very same, same truths. Of course, we could say that maybe some languages are, are more apt at communicating or conveying the universal truths than others. But nevertheless, like we, we don't say that this language is wrong or that language is wrong or even that there's like an admixture of truth and false in a given language. It, it's just not answering that question, right? Like it's, it's a different no. category. So I, I took very grave issue with the comparison he made with the analogy he made and a lot of pope explainers out there are trying to say that like oh well you know it, it's just like what vatican ii said it's just like what lumen gentium said you know there are rays of light in it and that no it's different it's fundamentally different notice vatican ii benedict the 16th they never made this comparison to languages because of this reason um i don't know why he like if he meant something else he could have used the rays of light analogy like that makes a lot more sense. That's a lot, much a better way at getting at the fact that there's fragmented elements of truth and that those elements of truth, as Vatican II says, can, uh, under God's providence, assist one, can help one in reaching the truth, but always impelling towards Catholic unity. Yeah. No, it, it, it's not. The, the analogy itself is problematic. But what's really bad is, number one, he said all the religions are paths to God. That's number one. That's a huge claim. It's a bad claim. Uh, it's, it's a false claim. And that's confirmed by the analogy. But then it's confirmed by the imperative that he seems to draw from it, which is the non-competitiveness that you cannot tell another person, hey, my God, my religion is more important and better than yours. Um, so he basically makes the claim, he gives an analogy to explain the claim, and then he gives sort of like an imperative of what you shouldn't do as a result of the logic of the claim and the analogy. And all of that builds up to um, basically saying, well, Christianity can't come to the Hindu Hinduism or Sikhism or Islam and say, hey, your guys' way, if you follow it, is leading to hell. You need to, you need to repent and believe the gospel in order to be saved, which is the biblical message. Um, so his message is antithetical to basic Christian teaching, and there is no charitable interpretation of the words. The, the best you can do is, well, he meant something completely opposite of what he said, which is kind of, uh, we're getting into a, a absurdity a little bit there, um, no, no, no hierarch in the past has, has been alleviated from the responsibility of owning what he said. You know, if you say, well, Christ has one nature, but you really meant that he had two natures, that's really odd. But all you have to do is come out and say, hey, sorry, I misspoke. What I said is egregiously wrong. But what I meant was Christ has two natures. So what's due here is for Pope Francis to come out and say, listen, uh, what I said, the analogy I used, the imperative of non-competitiveness is all wrong. Uh, what I should have said was what Vatican II says or what uh, Dominus Iesus says, um, you know, something like that. So I, that's the fix. There is no fix with, well, it's, you know, he said that um, the other religions are have participations in the, the, the good, the true, and the beautiful, and that there's a scale, um, you know, that reaches the fullness in Christianity. No, that he can't mean that because his minimum message was the imperative. You can't go to another religion and say, my God's more important. My religion is more true than yours. He, 
he 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 preclu- he excludes the message of Lumen Gentium chapters 14 through 16. In my opinion. Yeah, and um you know, I was just there's so many attempts I've seen to try to to square the circle here and um again as I've said earlier like they, they will always try to say that um well he said in elsewhere that Christ is the way that Christ is the only way to salvation he said that in other in in, in other uh moments therefore he couldn't have meant what we're trying to say well i think that one way to look at it and you tell me what you think about this is i think that what he is doing is he is essentially repudiating the communio school of thinking when it comes to how to understand outside the church there's no salvation and he is kind of landing on the Rahner school of thought um which, which essentially says that in this vague abstract sense christ is the way the truth and the life he is the full revel- full fullness of, of god's self-disclosure self-revelation but um because our nature is so radically inclined towards the reception of grace these multiple religions the, the the plurality of religions each in their own way um are paths to christ that seemed to be Rahner's view um and then that's that's where he gets this idea of the anonymous christian right this this idea that you can be a christian even if you don't know it and the best way that you can be this anonymous christian for like a buddhist is to be a good buddhist is to be a good Muslim or or to be a good Hindu according to your conscience, right? This this uh this priority, this absolute priority of conscience, and um, <laughs> apologies, I have a minor cough. Um, and it, it it seems to me that that's, I mean, Rahner articulated it at a much higher level of sophistication than Pope Francis, of course. Um, and 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 correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm mischaracterizing what Rahner said, and and I know he maybe I'm, um. Uh, opining more on, on the logical conclusion of what, of, of what Rodder said. But um, it seems to me that that's kind of where he's going. That seems to me how he would try to square the circle there is, is, is to um, pivot towards um, that uh, school of thinking. But it seems to me that Dominus Jesus has completely ruled that out. Like Dominus Jesus is, is, is seemed to me to be a repudiation of the Rodder school of thought, of the, of the anonymous Christian. And Benedict XVI himself in an interview, repudiated the idea as well. So I don't see how um, uh, we can go there. Yeah. So this this is what's this is one of the points that we've heard from some of the uh, what let's call them the Pope splainers, right? I I had I had somebody recently tell me that um, the term is is dumb. And what does it mean? You know, it's just a silly term. Uh, it's just it's just a way to use uh, less than half a second to refer to a certain a group of influencers and people online or in conversation who um, are stretching the bounds of reason. I'd like to give a I'd like to work out like a tentative definition of a Pope's player. I'm actually planning on writing, doing a whole video on it. Um, I think we, we want to distinguish it from like the noble intention to defend the Pope against unjust criticism, right? Like th- th- that seems to me to be th- – that's just what a loyal son of the church does. But to me what, what a Pope explainer is, it, he's somebody who upon hearing an ambiguous – or a controversial statement of the Pope, their knee-jerk reaction is not to interpret the Pope according to what he said, so much as interpreting the Pope in accordance with their a priori assumptions about magisterial safety. Like that's that is their go-to. That their knee-jerk reaction is to say, okay, he must have met meant this that and the other thing because of my a priori assumptions about what is entailed by 
the indefectibility of the church, that it cannot extend to allowing for an instance where the, where the Pope teaches something in his non-definitive magisterium that contradicts higher level church teaching. And it's on that basis that they explain away everything that the Pope says. So, so it, it, it's, and one reason why I think that, because like, someone might say, well, you do the same thing when you come across an apparent contradiction in scripture or, or something else. But I think the difference is that one, when we're talking about scripture or even like definitive teachings of, of the popes, um, that's a matter of divine revelation, right? Um, and, and if we were to throw that away, we would have to ultimately throw away divine revelation itself, the Christian faith. Um, it's not to say that the Christian faith is unfalsifiable, but it is to say that if we were to admit a contradiction there, we would have to throw away the Christian faith. But we, that is not the case with this magisterial safety idea. This is theologumina. This is theological opinion. So it's mm -hmm. like, it seems to me it's, it's dishonesty, disingenuousness is um, taking the front seat here because th there's no compulsion to... Uh, uh, trap yourself in these categories of thought uh, by necessity. I mean, you, you could just throw away the a priori assumptions, you know? Right. Yeah, I think that's a good that's a good uh, uh, description. Um, I, I also have a tendency to think that, you know, also in contrast to the noble guy, the noble Catholic, who's trying to do his service to the. Um, divine establishment of the papacy is um, somebody who is all right having a very poor expectation of the universe i mean the, the universal roman pontiff uh, such that um, as long as he's not teaching heresy or is a heretic then basically uh, we can we we must talk about him and uh, cover over anything else that may be objectively critical um, in such a way that if it was somebody else like a cardinal or a bishop or a priest and obviously like a lay person. Uh, it would warrant uh, no criticism, uh, no serious consequences. In other words, I, I'm thinking of like, um, uh, like I'll just mention reason and theology. I don't even want to mention the name, but reason and theology. When they're, when when he is talking about um, the Pope, you know, recently he he compared the situation of a pope in the past who committed adultery and was caught and the husband of the woman he committed adultery with uh, killed the pope, right? Um, I didn't actually look into the historicity of this thing, but I'm sure it happened. And um, so with a, with a person like that, you know, if you have a pope that's in a situation like that, he doesn't deserve... 35 hours of YouTube videos with him wearing sunglasses and people saying he's based because he's met the bare minimum of orthodoxy, right? If, if the Pope has done things that are objectively heinous and that are, um, that, that, that are, are, are meant to destroy and scandalize, um, we may not want to go all out and, you know, be insulting and be uh, uh, and, and, you know, exceed the boundaries. But you also don't want to be going to the other side and making it seem like this guy is uh, the best thing in the world. See, and I, it makes us come off like and I've said this before, but like snake oil salesman, like it's it's yeah. it's, it's slimy. It's like use car car salesman kind of tactics. And another thing that gets me is like a lot of these people will concede, will readily concede um, isolated incidents of the Pope's misdoings on these occasions. But then it, it, it's like 
after every incident, it's a blank slate all over again. And it's as if none of that ever happened. And so, like, we, we, we can't, we, we, we can't, have an assessment of the Pope according to a pattern of behavior. It has to be like either we're talking about a specific incident or he's an angel. Like right. he's, he's an angel right. like 99% of the time, except in these scattered incidents. But outside of the context of those scattered incidents, like he's the most base Pope ever. And it's like, that's just nah. wearing like fun house glasses like that's just yeah. not seeing it's reality crazy. you know yeah. have you noticed anyway, this just to speak to your point about Rana, because this is where yeah. you know this is this is uh um the point we want to establish here is that uh he is going in the ronarian route uh Rahner, as those of you who've studied Rahner know uh he did make a he was very strong on the exclusivity of christ as the only ontological way to heaven, right? But, um, and, and this is why I hesitate to make such a huge divergence between Rahner and Ratzinger. I'll probably get some flack for this, but uh, Rahner would just simply say, and this is what I think Pope Francis would say, because, you know, you've got these Pope Splainers who are saying, what are you talking about? He said this last year and the year before that Jesus was the only way. Okay, well, Rahner said the same thing, okay? But what he understood by that was when you, and I'll just use a practical example, if you have a Hindu who is in a room with that ugly doll, the 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 Durga goddess, you know, with the, with the makeup and the headgear, it's this big doll with white, pale skin. And, and if you've got a Hindu that's worshiping Durga, that that's what the person is doing objectively. In their minds, they're thinking that they're worshiping Durga. But behind Durga, like a background receiver, like a background receptor, uh, Christ is kind of like, sucking in the things that he can suck in like well this person has a desire for the divine let me scoop that up uh this person is looking to love their neighbor as themselves as themselves and they're looking to durga for assistance in how to do that well i can't take the durga part but i can take the desire to love and, and so it's like behind the Durga, um, Christ is like absorbing all that he can. It's like and an so imperfect, it's, it's like right. a manifestation of the same reality. Yes. In other words, he, in other words, this is the way that Pope Francis would probably also reconcile his statements on the exclusivity of Christ. Right. And then how you could worship Durga for the rest of your life and still be saved through the one Christ, the son of God. Um, it's because Christ is kind of like in the background of all this pagan and false religion. And he's sucking in anything he can that would be good, would be conformable to the natural law or right. You know, you, and I, I hope. I mean, it, it's it's crazy to really um, speculate on this on any kind of like uh, uh, real consideration. But here we are. We we're at the point now, and we've been here for decades, where we're actually conceiving of what I'm talking about. And I, I think that's what Pope Francis would say. So I don't think he's contradicting himself, and I don't think that he intended to tell the Singaporeans that they needed to follow Christ in order to be saved. Right. And, and I think that he's, he's just, these are what happens and Rahner did this. This, these are reinterpretations of the same doctrines. These is according to a purported higher and more enlightened degree of, of understanding. Um, and I mean, that kind of is 
that uh, that underlies what I mean, and I don't like throwing this word around, but what modernism really was was about, right? It's it's this right. re reinterpretation of the same doctrines according to new senses, and and th- th- that and then I don't think that Vatican II went there with Lumen Gentium. I, I think it Lumen Gentium that was more of a synthesis of do- legitimate doctrinal development on this matter, but. This does like this. These are new senses reintroduced into old packaging, and uh, yeah, I mean it's it's pretty clear to me that that that, that is what he meant. Because otherwise, Pope Francis would be an idiot, right? Like he he would he would be affirming one thing and then contradicting himself. Like I give him a little bit more credit than that. I think that in his own mind, he thinks that you can say Christ is objectively he is the ontological singularity if you will um but right. but that these other religions are, are kind of uh external they give external structure to what is in reality one and the same religious impulse that is yes. nurtured by christ in and through these the, the, these traditions yes and and i think that you know and i think we've talked about this before um, I do think that the door was opened for this. Um, and, and I don't, I'm not trying to say a justification for it, but a door, a, a, a crack in the door was made when Pope Pius the ninth, uh, he, he said in a decree, uh, I can't remember the name of the decree off the top of my head. It's on my blog. If you just, Go to ericibarra.wordpress.com, type in Pius the Ninth, um, no salvation outside the church, something like that. You'll see the article. Uh, he made a decree where he said that it's possible for people who labor in invincible ignorance of the true religion to obtain eternal redemption. And he gave a number of conditions, right? Um, and it looks like those conditions are, you know, uh, theism, like there's a recognition that one has to long for God, believe in God, and follow the conscience, the, the dictates of their conscience to the best of their ability, um, albeit under the supporting help of God's grace. Uh, so a crack in the door was made there for not just non Catholics, but non Christians. Um, and uh, what we see going into the 21st century is um, some of the statements from the Holy Office at the time, now called the Dicastery, the Doctrine of the Faith, uh, and then obviously in Lumen Gentium and some other supporting documents from Vatican II, is um, that you you know you can be a, a somebody who's part of another faith and still be saved. And um, it went so far, and I know this is still kind of a debate today, but... I do think that um, Lumen Gentium did uh, speak about the possibility of somebody who doesn't even believe in God explicitly um, finding salvation. I know that there's some debate about that, but uh, in answer to some of the problems that have been going around since the 60s and the 70s, uh, Dominus Jesus was published, and uh, I think it was in the year 2000, 2001, yeah. I can't remember. Um, and in that document, you, you've you got, once again, um, an, a reaffirmation of the exclusivity of Christ, but then you also have this recognition that whatever good whatever is good, true, and beautiful in the false religions um, can serve to assist and prepare people for the gospel. And uh, even uh, if they have invincible ignorance and never attain to an explicit knowledge of Christ, uh, may assist in their own eternal redemption, uh, participation in the Paschal mystery. And so, I, you know, I think what has happened 
is you've got this deadly shift in looking at that as very improbable, something not to consider, something not to rely upon sure. in order to extinguish uh, missions to a high probabilistic view that given the mercy of God, the love of God, and the ignorance of the world and how everybody's just such a fuzzy wuzzy little booger head and nobody really knows what's going on and we're all suffering and we're all you know poor thing pobrecita and you get a guy uh trained in the schools like for Jorge Bergoglio and he ends up taking what Pius the Ninth said what the Holy Office said in the 1940s, what Vatican II said, what Ratzinger said, but he mixes it in with this extremely um, high probabilistic view that, you know, this is not something that is rare. It's not something that we shouldn't talk about. This is something that we can just sort of flaunt right. out in the open. Because remember... This this thing he did in Singapore, uh, classical theists, he did his thing where he's asking the audience questions. Remember, he did this with the atheist yeah. uh, father. He he just knew that the people around him are all secular humanists. He, he yeah yeah they're Catholics whatever, but he he just knows that the general population are humanists. It's what's going to favor us and diversity. Right. So so he just does, he knows what he's going to get from the audience. Remember he said, you know, this this little boy's father, he didn't believe in God. Um he was an atheist. He had his son baptized, but he 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 we could see that he had good intentions. And does God turn away his children, when they have good intentions, and he asked the audience, and the audience didn't answer right away. He goes, I can't hear you, you know? And they all say, no, no, God doesn't do that. And, and so he establishes his point that here's an atheist who all he had to do was get his son baptized. And for Pope Francis, that was like equivalent to martyrdom. Because right. the, 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 boy, the boy was enabled to pray to the father, right? Um, and- yeah, I mean, it seems like, where, whereas before, these, like you were saying, this was talked about in exceptional terms. It was like God, his mercy extending despite the falsehoods, despite right. the sin, despite the errors. And that his mercy can, can save someone even despite all this darkness. Um, but but it's, it's, it seems like this new spin is that, no, this diversity of religion is, is part of the positive wisdom of God, that, that, that God's wisdom is on display in and through the plurality of these religious traditions, and that, um, and that, and that just like other languages, um, you know, you, you, you can get at the truth if you speak your language well. Yes. If you speak your language well, then you're going to communicate the truth well. Um, and then, then that's a totally different paradigm. It's a different paradigm that, that, that we're dealing with here. And uh, it's it, – it's, I, I think people – because they, they – they, and I don't mean to be mean, but I think some people lack the sophistication to – get at the, the precise nuances that Vatican II was articulating. And I take your point that um, maybe there's some regret in in, in uh, maybe those formulations provided too much wiggle room. But, um, but nevertheless, I think they were sufficiently nuanced enough to, at least formally speaking, avoid these entailments. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it just it just seems to me that uh, people lack the sophistication to to recognize those nuances, and and, and and so they just, without thinking, say, "Oh, well, he's just reiterating Vatican II. He's just reiterating the same thing." When it's not, it's 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 different. 
he's coming from a different school of thought and and, and it's a school of thought that that i think is certainly religious and differentist in nature and i don't see how you avoid those conclusions and so i think the next question is uh, he hasn't taught this at, at a magisterial level but 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 what, what what do you think should be our response as lay faithful because i've tried for very long to be and i, and I still will be um as respectful as i can toward the holy father because he remains the pope um i i, I try to uh defend him when he is being maligned but 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 you know on some level it's it's like what's the utility in defending him against an unjust charge if he is somebody who 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 believes this glaring error about 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 soteriology about salvation about the role of Jesus Christ in in the economy of of, of salvation how does that not taint every every other thing he says and, and does yeah yeah well look um like i said before uh his words his message and in all likelihood all likelihood his intention um is contrary to the gospel and and so this was not something that was said behind doors in a scalfari interview this was not something that we have second hand uh, this is something that we heard from him's mouth. It would be equivalent if somebody were to see St. Peter say for the third time, I don't know who that man is. Okay. What are you supposed to do in that situation? Well, what did Christ say? I have prayed for you. I have prayed for thee. That when you're, when you are once converted, you strengthen the brethren, right? Uh, that's coming from the Son of God. And he's Almighty God, you know, the Son petitioning the Father. Um, we know that that's distinct, but I don't see any other takeaway for for us. We, you, you rightly mentioned that this is not a magisterial decree. Uh, thank God it's not a magisterial decree. Um, but it is a complete, and I would say definitive exposition that Pope Francis, the man, um, does not uphold the traditional Christian faith. And so I think that we can pray for his soul. Yeah, because it his... seems like what, what some people are saying is like, it's like people like Michael Lofton and others, they are conceding that this was a mistake. But it's like they don't recognize the gravity of this specific error because it's it's like they hear something like this and they say, oh, well, he should have worded that better. Oh, well, he should have done better. That wasn't the best. That wasn't prudent. And it's like we're not talking about some 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 imprudent motu proprio legislation about like <laughs> – the administration of religious orders or something like that okay like we're talking right. about we're talking about the, the 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 most basic affirmation of the exclusivity of christ as as the gate to heaven as as the way to salvation and and how that has been consistently articulated and upheld by the church throughout the ages like and and, and if you can't uphold that that <coughs> has to taint yeah, Everything I, about your assessment of the man, right? Um, and, and and maybe we 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 can we can bifurcate this to some degree, and then and say, okay, we will be um, obedient insofar as he commands our obedience. But what I cannot understand is how someone can just say, um, okay, this is wrong. And then after recognizing it's wrong, let's go on uh, cheer, cheer, cheering, rah, rah, rah. And he's the most base Pope ever in all other circumstances. And it's like, how, how, how does that, how, how, how does your head not explode from cognitive dissonance? Yeah, no, th this is, you know, and I, I, I listened to <clears throat> all of the streams that Michael Lofton did on it. I listened to Trent Horn. I listened to Catholic Answers. 
I listen to Drew the Catholic is another YouTube channel. I listen to some other Catholics who have very few subscribers, and they they were spot on. I listened to this one channel. It's called the Catholic Skeptic. It's an older gentleman. You know, he's got his gray hair, and and um, he he is just two thousand subscribers. And boy, he got it solid. You know, he said, look, uh, I'm not trying to judge the man. Um, I pray for him and uh, I love the Catholic Church. I love the papacy. But this was um, an absolute contradiction to the basic Christian faith. And there's no other way to, to twist it and turn it. But well, Lofton and Horn, um, what they try to do is they try to say, well, there's a, there's a charitable interpretation. There's a favorable interpretation of what Pope Francis said. Um, and so we're bound to that, but Lofton, um, what looks apparently like a lot for the first time belabored the fact that <clears throat> Pope Francis, number one, causes confusion. Number two, he is a bad communicator, which I don't agree with. I thought I thought he communicated quite clearly, and that he doesn't he doesn't help by not fixing what is a clear scandal created by his words. So Lofton went into some criticisms of Pope Francis, but he didn't get to the issue that he is one of the reasons why he's so incredible uh, to the, to the eyes of thinking people is that, look, it can walk like a duck, sound like a duck, smell like a duck, but we're demanded. It, it's a mandate for us not to say it's a duck. It doesn't, it, it gets to a point where it's like, nobody thinks that way. No, nobody's going to respect that kind of thinking. It's just ridiculous. You know, and I, I gave the analogy of uh, of a pros, you know, a defense attorney, a, 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 a client, and a prosecutor, where you know the the prosecutor gets the client that's being defended on the stand, and just straight up asks the guy, "Hey, look, you know, we've been at this for eight months. Yes or no? Did you commit this murder?" And the client says. Yes. And then the, the defense attorney gets up and says, well, jury, um, I, I want you to know that we are obliged to give a, an inter a charitable interpretation of this. We, you know, if we want to love our neighbor as ourselves, what would you want to be done to you if you were in this circumstance? So what I propose is that when my client audibly said yes, he, in his mind, intended to say no. And so we should register it in the minutes as a denial to the question. Right. The, but it was, okay, is it possible that my client actually said yes, but meant no? In the world of all possibilities, is that possible? Yes. It is possible. Is it absurd to take him that way? Of course it is. But Lofton is of the perspective that you are required by charity to do something like that. Yeah. And I think with what, what when you're at that stage where you're going to do that, um, there is no fix to the problem because right. you're literally you you are literally taking objectivity and intentionality and putting them at a parallel distinction infin infinitely you can right. always infinitely put yeah. them at odds with each other and so what you've got there lofton is an is uh, unintended by you is an infinite loop to defend pope francis yeah. And um, sorry to say, that's what's ruining the credibility of reason. And right. And, and that's why I feel like there are no breaks to it. And, and I feel like he could say anything at this point. And there would always be that crack in the door. 
there, there would always be that that theoretical possibility that he meant something other than what he said. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's, it's where you take charity and you put it in conflict with reason. Right. With, 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 and, and then that is something that is just, just, I think alien to Catholic sensibilities, right? Like if, yeah. if, if, if you're, if you're giving somebody the benefit of the doubt means that you have to forgo your critical thought, that you have to forgo your rational faculties, then that cannot, that, that, that just can't be right. But that cannot be a faithful and an authentic application of charity. Like charity is always going to serve the truth. It's always going to be congruent with with, with 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 a with a straightforward application of common sense <laughs> and um and, and and if that conflicts with your a priori assumptions about what the ineffectibility of the church should look like then maybe you got to mm-hmm. rework your your a priori assumptions maybe yeah. maybe you got to go back to the drawing board That's uh, right. i i know that your 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 dissertation might have uh, rested on this on, on these uh <laughs> Right. a priori presuppositions but but maybe you got to give that up man like like, like maybe yeah you, you dug yourself yeah. into a hole in your writing and then you gotta rethink this a little bit remodel yeah yeah i mean look it, it's not a waste of time i mean we spend years on all yeah. these things um and sometimes we're better off uh we're better off realizing we're wrong over even the course of years because we're we're better we're better now than we were before because now we know better why my original assessment was wrong. Uh, so you can only, it only serves to benefit, you know, yeah. you know, but at least Horn and Lofton did express that the Pope is a reckless leader. He's poor. His behavior has been poor. And especially now uh, Lofton made this point, which, and I'm glad that he uh, emphasized this. Uh, and so did, Trent Horn, that now that the Pope knows, um, uh, because we're not going to even entertain the people who are going to say, well, you think the Pope knows? We're not going to even entertain that, right? Now that the Pope knows that the perception is that he is a religious pluralist, and he says nothing, this is similar to what he did with the Scalfari situation, um and uh, some some other instances. Now, if we get absolutely nothing, if he pulls one of those things, it's like I'm not going to say a word about this thing. Um, that also solidifies the need to pray for him, because it's it's very clear that um, he is not being he's being negligent, is what I'm trying to say. And so I'm I'm happy that Lofton and Horn at least got to that you know, the typical interpretation of Honorius where he's negligent uh, right. to his to his duties. Um, so, but yeah, the second thing to the Mediterranean folks in Albania where he says that the religious cultures and the religious identities in their communities there are all a gift from God. The differentiation is rich and a, a gift from God. That also doubles down on what he said um, before, because um, you know he he's basically saying that God. How, how do you how do you enrich a culture with diversity that you would say is rich and a gift from God, and then say the same thing about the religions, but not mean that God intended those differences by design, like by well, positive. That, that mm-hmm. also, that kind of gives us a, a fresh look back <laughs> at uh, what he said a few years back um, about the distinction between God's uh, antecedent and permissive will with respect to the diversity of religions. Like he, he was compelled right. to walk it back a bit, but in light of these new comments, one, one, one is let to think, well, well, what value is that correction? <laughs> really? I mean, right. uh, if, if, if this is really what he means, um, 
the, like because what he's saying here is not at all in harmony with the idea that, that this is just the permissive will of God. Um, no, I mean if, if, if the diversity is it emanates from a bestowal of gifts from God, then clearly he is antecedently willing the, the, the diversity of these religious traditions. And, um, and I don't see a way around that. I mean, it's just, so that seems to me it, it, it allows us to, to, to look back at some of the other things that he said and since corrected and, and, and we can start to ask questions like, well, what do those corrections really mean anymore? No. Yeah. This is, this is stuff that back in 2005, when I was studying the basics of evangelism, I remember I was going through the way of the master with Kirk Cameron and uh, Ray comfort. I also used the James Kennedy's um, evangelization tools. We were taught how to respond to objections that we would get when we went street preaching or when we went on into the city and we were, we were told, Hey, you're going to run across people who tell you that, Hey, you know, all religions re are like paths up the mountain and, you know, your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth, but we shouldn't be at odds with each other over that. We were, I was taught back in 2005, how to answer these basic errors and Lo and behold, you know, 20 years later, here I am at, at uh, you know, I'm at um, what I would say a mature state of my development, and I'm s sitting under the Roman pontiff, and I'm hearing it from his own mouth. You know, it's quite startling. It's quite startling. Um, so, and I'd be lying if I didn't, uh, I, I was deeply disturbed by this. I was deeply disturbed by it. Um, some people, I, I've gotten private messages. So are you leaving the Catholic church? No, no, I'm not leaving the Catholic church, but I am deeply hurt by this. And I think ever, a lot of people are deeply hurt. Um, and I think it only, it only serves to deepen the wound when you've got folks out there uh, who are trying to say that, no, you're, you are the problem, Eric. Your education on these things is the problem. Don't you know Acts 17, the unknown God? Paul said it. Paul said that the Athenians, right, right. The Athenians were worshiping the unknown God, which is probably a point we should talk about. Yeah. Because Acts 17 has been the mouse hole that has turned into the oasis where the, the, the modernistic trajectory picked up more by Rahner and company have used as a, as a uh, catalyst in order to incorporate this diversity, exclusivity, tension with all the world religions and the exclusivity of Christ. So, so why don't you give your thought on that? Like, yeah, what, so what, I, what do you I, think? What's your well, best exegesis of that passage in light of the exclusivity of Christ? Right. Well, you know, um, Paul has to be read with everything else he says, right? This is it's interesting because when it comes to the Pope, it's like you got to interpret him according to everything he said, right? Um, but for Paul, it's like all we got to do is go to Acts 17, and he says, oh, the unknown God whom you worship, him I will speak of. And it's like, boom, that's all we need to know. He just said they worship God, so it, you know, now we need to construct an entire theology on how these Athenians were actually anonymous Christians. Um, that's absurd, okay? Paul, in, in his letters, if you take his corpus and see what he says about pagan practices and what they achieve, right? Nowhere does he say it achieves koinonia with the true God. In fact, he says that 
it wards and forbids communion with the true God. We know this, as you know, uh, in 1 Corinthians, where he says the table of demons and the table of the Lord are not participable. You can't, you can't have a share in both of them, right? And uh, 1 Thessalonians, he says that um, they, you know, the word is the Macedonians say about Thessaly, they turned away from idols to serve the true and living God, okay? Ephesians 2 he says, once bef before you before you were known by Christ, you were. This is Ephesians chapter two. I'll read it for you because this is a this is one of those texts that the Acts seventeen folks don't really like to go to because it seems as though Paul go eat popcorn. That's how I remember Ephesians. Go eat pop. Okay, yeah. Um, this is this, this is where Paul almost sounds like. Uh, completely out of harmony with what they're saying. Um, yeah, he says, uh, but, uh, okay, wall of hostility without God. This is, uh, yes, Ephesians 2, verse 12. Remember that you, pagan Ephesians, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. Let's just stop right there. Paul can speak to these Ephesians and tell them that there was a time that they were separated from Christ. And he goes on, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. We all know that. It's common sense. And strangers to the covenants of promise. And then this is what he says. Having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ, you, were, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So right there, Paul is saying to the Ephesians, hey, before you were alienated, you, didn't, you, had, you were not beneficiaries of the Israeli covenants. You were outside, right? And, and not only did he say that in a way that well, Eric, of course he meant the external bonds. Duh. But he could mean the invisible bonds were there, right? What does he say? He says, without God and without hope. Now, we don't have to absolutize that necessarily, but we should give it its, cons its due weight. Paul does not have the perspective that these Gentile pagans were somehow, you know, worshiping God, right? So in Acts 17, um, he uses the inscription on that altar to the unknown God as sort of a roundabout tool in order to tell them, hey, look, you guys, you guys worship what you know, you know Zeus, you know, uh, you know, all these different god, gods and goddesses, the whole pantheon, you know them. Well, there's one that you recognize that you don't know. Okay. I'm going to tell you about what you don't know. And I looked into the commentaries on this, Augustine, um, uh, Chrysostom, and, and it almost sounds like they do, like what the Vatican II-ish, you know, I, I shouldn't say Vatican II, but what do you, the Ronarian methodology of Acts 17. Uh, almost sounds like they do it, but then they clarify, no, they didn't worship the true God through this altar. They explicitly say this. Uh, I think it's homily 38 in, in Corinthians. Read the whole thing, friends, from Chrysostom. Uh, and there's not a lot of patristic commentary on this thing with to the unknown God. If you go to like uh, IVP's uh, in, um, commentary, ancient Christian commentary series on the book of Acts, for example, um, it quotes from Chrysostom, Bede the Venerable, but it doesn't really have, you know, an extensive uh, collection of quotations there. Uh, there were Christians, especially like, uh, Neoplatonizing thinkers who thought that they could pump out a lot from Acts 17, as we're seeing today. But I don't think that 
this is the a way to say, hey, look, Paul said that they were worshiping God already. Um, I don't think that that's, you know, and even even if that was the case in that same in that same sermon, he tells them the ignorance is over with. God has looked God has God has overlooked the ignorance of the past, but now commands every man everywhere. Acts 17, 30 and 31. He commands men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world through Jesus Christ. Right. Now that that is the message that Pope Francis is bound to share. All the popes in the first millennium say, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Right? Paul said it. <laughs> so Pope Francis better be saying that to himself. Uh, and yet what we heard was not God has overlooked the ignorance of the past, but now there is a heavenly summons from God to believe in Jesus Christ. Nope, that's not what we got. We got what we got is all the religions can't compete with each other. One telling the other, I'm more right than you. No, where does that get us? Woo, woo. It, it, it's just, it's secular humanism. It's contrary to the basic Christian teaching. It's so ugly and scandalous. There's not much more to say about it other than we need to light candles for Pope Francis. We need to get on our knees for Pope Francis. I'm going to do my evening office with my family uh, in the Book of Common Prayer. Yes, I'm in the Anglican Ordinariate. I'm going to be praying for Pope Francis. My kids know about this, friends. My 16-year-old goes to a classical academy. The kids talk about this. So when he comes home and he asks me, Dad, you know, didn't you teach us like about that whole elephant theory where like all the people are holding to different parts of the elephant and everybody's, you know, is, or all the world religions are the same? Did the Pope really say that? And he said, and, and my oldest son said it so loud that all my other sons heard it. See, I actually like the elephant theory, except... The elephant is Catholicism, right? Like the whole elephant is Catholicism, right? But 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 yeah, I mean, I, I totally get what you're saying. And to go back to this whole Act 17 thing, um, it's it's like so. It's actually very easy to understand what that's really getting at. Like it, it's it's clearly like the gods. The, the polytheistic deities, you know, they, they're they getting at certain positive goods, certain attributes of the created order, mistaking those for the divine himself. Um, and, and Paul is, 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 is kind of injecting a, a certain healthy degree of apophaticism into this, into the equation and saying... You know, strip all of that away, and you, what are you left with? You're left with, 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 with the unbounded God, the the, the God who, who who cannot be mistaken for any uh, positive created attribute in the world, um, and 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 so th they're, they're they're grappling with this apophatic impulse. Um, to 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 ascend to the unknown God, the God beyond knowing, the the, the, the God, uh, you know, as, as Dionysius would say, beyond being, you know, uh, super essential, and uh, they're they're grappling with that apophatic impulse, and that impulse, as Vatican II says, if you follow it, will impel you toward Catholic unity, will impel you toward the true God. And as you were saying, once the once once that veil of ignorance is lifted, now you have the formal obligation to follow it through, to yeah. follow that train through, and that's Augustine, what's missing. Augustine says, some, you know, in the City of God, um, 
Yeah, he, he, br- he brings up how the, these Athenians were, um, they were apt to get this element. But, you know, but he belabors the point that they think they, they worship demons. Yeah. You know, um, so it, it, you just got to be careful not to say that that these were worshipers of God. And, um, you know, in the way that uh, in, in the way that they're bound to do it is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, th- I think that that was uh, we have one question, a super chat question it says, could another Honorius happen after Vatican one? I don't know exactly what he's getting at there, <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> I guess maybe what he's saying is that it does. Does Vatican I maybe preclude, like, the, 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 does the, the demands of Vatican I preclude another incident precisely like that from happening again? What did, did you want to answer that, or do you want me to answer it? Kind of curious. I mean, you've done a lot of studies in, in the <clears throat> Yeah. Well, uh, the first thing I would say is that, uh, you know, Honorius was condemned posthumously. So not only Vatican I, but we're talking about uh, a more developed Western canon law would preclude another instance of uh, condemning somebody. Because remember, the, the anathema of Honorius was not simply to what he said. Um, the, council, the council had some nasty things to say about him. The imperial edict that was published right afterwards um, accused him of resurrecting Apollinarianism and that he was wicked for it. Um, So, I mean, they judged him as a heretic in material and form, okay? 40 years after he was dead. I don't think the, 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 you know, post-Gratian canon law um, the way that the Catholic Church adjudicates heretics, right. um, I think that that would completely preclude another precise, um, you know, honorious situation. So we don't even have to go to Vatican I to say that that's sure. precluded. But if he's asking, um, is it possible for somebody, for a pope to become a material heretic or a formal heretic? Um, and uh, after Vatican I, um, I, I don't see anything that uh, would preclude that from Vatican I. Yeah, I, I don't either. I, I mean, there is, um, I think that one thing that Vatican I did do is it, 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 it kind of completely solved the conciliarist crisis finally. In, right. in a certain way. I mean, a lot of people don't realize this, but I mean, the, but that the, the conciliarist error, heresy, uh, you know, during during the fifteenth, uh, sixteenth century, wasn't really fully resolved until Vatican I. I would argue, <laughs> um, and it was a very long-standing problem in the church, and then how and how the church grappled with this. Uh, with, with with these concepts, um, and uh, so so I think in, in in some regard, you know, Vatican One furthers the development of doctrine on the papacy in in, in a way where you wouldn't, um, it, it it would it would be very difficult to envision a scenario where conciliar authority would have um the last word as as far right. as the pope's orthodoxy but right um yeah leo the second you know was was really what nailed the you know put the nail in the coffin on honorius yeah um, you know but that he's a pope judging a pope so i mean i i i don't personally know how a reigning pontiff could be deposed or um, fired from office. Obviously, that's impossible. Um, I, I don't know how much I am 
convinced by the theories of a recognition of a self forfeiture of office by, you know, manifest formal uh, obstinate heresy. Uh, I don't know. I go back and forth on those things because uh, it's it's the both views are riddled with complications. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, you know, so anyway, I, there's only so much to say about it. Yeah. Um, we have a, another super chat which says, "As an Eastern Orthodox convert to Catholicism, this stuff always gets very disheartening. It makes it harder and harder to not regret my decision." Um, love both of you guys' work, though, and God bless. Yeah, well, I mean, I'd like to say what, like one thing about that, and I'd like to know what you have to say. Um, I think we do want to reiterate the fact that that this really, um, what what the Pope said, especially in, in this case, it, it is in his private capacity as as like a person. It, he he did not bind anyone to his formulation of this teaching at all. Um, and at that point, like, look, I think that we really have to be careful not to, not to resurrect the caricature that Protestants used to, uh, you know, flail around ab ab about the like the impeccability of, of of the Pope. I mean, it seems like before Pope Francis, for whatever reason, we were re we, like. We, we would push back rather hard on Protestants who would um, overinflate the implications of a papal infallibility to extend to these various circumstances um, or, or even the indefectibility to extend to these various circumstances. And, and we would say, well, no, no like there's actually we, – we, we would try to err on more of a minimalist – approach to these things um you know because we, we we would have to in order to make sense of of the complications of church history but it, it seems like for whatever reason ever since pope francis has just been like that that's gone out the window and then now we have fully become that caricature some of us some of these commentators have become that character and i think that has been disheartening for that's, new converts yeah. like new converts come in and then and, and, and or, or you know inquirers they're like they, they they see like especially all these memes about like Pope Francis is like the most base pope ever and it's like uh that doesn't match like that they're not wearing the same rose tinted glasses that they are and so it kind of looks like a like a cult from the outside looking in i think and yeah. why would anyone be attracted to uh lies and deceit <laughs> Yes, I think you're right on the money there. Um, in fact, um, the Secretary General at the First Vatican Council, um, Joseph Fessler, um, I want to say he was the Bishop of... Oh, I can't remember. Let me look it up real quick. But he wrote a book shortly after um, Vatican I, because a well-known German historian, uh, okay, so he was the Bishop of St. Paulton in Austria, um, jo Joseph Fessler, that's J-O-S-E-F and then F-E-S-S-L-E-R. There was a German, a, a pretty well-renowned you know, German historian who wrote a book basically disproving the decree on papal infallibility. And all he did was he went through all these scenarios in the first and second millennium where popes got historical facts wrong. Um, they changed their minds about things. And, you know, he was just, I mean, he had a lot to go through. And he thought that, boy, he packed his magazine with all the lethal bullets to destroy the First Vatican Council. Well, Joseph Fessler, again, Secretary General at the Council, um, he wrote a book called True and False Infallibility of the Roman Pontiff. And the whole entire book 
is written in order to uh, undo the damage of that particular German author and the, the, the motor of his thought was infallibility is restricted to the conditions of supreme teaching upon the whole church, the ex cathedra teachings of the Roman pontiff. And uh, so he was able to quickly dispel this German critic and Pope Pius IX actually got a copy mm. and uh, he gave his own personal approbation. And uh, in the second or third edition, they were, uh, uh, they were able to, uh, to add Pius IX's um, approbation to the front uh, of the book. So, I mean, it's a caricature. It's been here forever. Yeah. Um, you know, St. Francis de Sales dealt with it. Um I see I see Eastern Orthodox online to this day sending me messages. How does if the Pope just said this, how are you still Catholic? Right. It's because they they don't equip themselves with uh this finely tuned distinction. And so it's almost forgotten right. easily, you know? And so it, 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 does that mean that this is okay? No. no. So this is still tragic. Like I said, it's still tragic. Um, it's it, for the Pope of Rome to come out and deny the gospel like this um, is, is uh, it's, you know, one of the worst news you could possibly get in the Catholic church. So it's not like, oh, you know, everything's all fine and dandy. No, it's not. We're in a pretty bad situation here. And yeah. The gates of hell will never prevail over the church. Doesn't mean, though, that the church will not suffer. It doesn't mean the church won't get sick. Right. And this is one of those things (laughs) that um, God has curiously allowed uh, this kind of human failing into the church. Yeah. That's that's it. That's as simple as it gets, guys. It's yeah. not going to get any. There's no like. You're not gonna. You're not gonna. You're not gonna find something in Bellarmine, Cajetan, uh, Ratzinger. You're not gonna find anything in any Catholic theologian that you're gonna be able to read, and then wake up tomorrow morning and say, "Oh, okay, everything's fine. I'm in the perfect religion." No, we're in a we're in a state of suffering right now. Um, the precious promises of Christ to the church have not been disproven, but we are going through a time of uh, darkness. And uh, if that's going to shake you up where you can't handle it, um, yeah, you, you've got the wrong expectations. Yeah. I think that's, that's the key, the wrong expectations. And uh, the, the, that's, that's, I think where a lot of the correction has to has to happen. Um, well, thank you, Eric, for for coming on, and I really value your insights. I think this has been a great discussion. Um, if you want to close out, me. yeah, yeah. If you just you know let people know where to where to find your stuff and and everything. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I uh, I've been laboring at uh, Patreon. So if you. If you want to have access to some of my courses, I have a whole course on Pope Honorius, take you through the whole thing um, on Patreon. Um, I've got a course on justification, uh, dealing with the Protestant debates. Um, I'm, I'm actually lecturing through my papacy book right now um, in, in my Patreon. Uh, and then I also have exclusive articles and other things that I put out there. Uh, I'm also preparing for a debate on the papacy with an Eastern Orthodox apologist. Um, Ubi Petrus will be meeting. Uh, will be meeting in person at the studio of Pines of Aquinas, October twelfth. Um, of course, I, I, the the debate topic excludes these recent events, but I'm sure that um, probably these, these recent events are probably going to come up. In that debate, that's fine. Um, but uh, uh, 
yeah, my Patreon. I'm on Facebook quite a bit. My 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 YouTube channel, Classical Christian Thought. Uh, I'm just trying to do what Reason and Theology did back in the day, where I had the best of the minds in our Catholic world today, even even non-Catholic world, um, doing interviews and discussions and roundtables. Uh, so if you're not already subscribed, please do. That'll be tremendously helpful. I think you do a great job job at that, man. Thank you. And uh, thank you for thank you for coming on and and uh, God bless you. Yeah, I'm, and I'm and I'm back now. I've, I've had a little bit of a hiatus due to you know getting adjusted to the newborn, and I've been sick. But I'll be putting out a lot more content. And uh, thank you so much for coming on, Eric. God bless you. Yep. God bless you, sir.